So I'd be curious to once you get going on the show, because we're going to do it. And they're often looking at that. Cycles will bring water back. And we have a disaster. Yeah, and it's hard. If this is going to change, a bit more extreme events. So I changed the timeline <laughs> a little bit because it occurred to me that one of the significant things recently for Los Cienegas has been our paleontological surveys and results from those. And what we found in those surveys is the Cretaceous period was very important in terms of deposition of material on Los Cienegas and the Cienega Valley. So the Cretaceous period was 145 to 66 million years ago. And at the end of that was one of the mass extinctions. And during the Cretaceous period, it was a very, this might sound kind of familiar, a very warm climate, high sea levels, inland seas not so much yet, um, but there's some similarities to some of the climate from back then to where we may be going in the future. So that's that. Okay, and then starting up here, we have some more advanced uh, ground. Again, before 12,000, crossing of the Bering Strait, by humans and following animals and animals. This is a mammoth. The mammoth was out there. This buried one that quickly died. This is a bison. There were some bison right at that time period. So the ice ages ended, and we did a huge ecological transition in terms of the mammoths and the species, grassland, plants, and so forth. But the lesson learned is that we also had big game hunting and intensive plant use during this time period. So next says something, various prehistoric incision and filling events on Sienega Creek. Excellent. <laughs> Dave, did you get that? And the, the lesson learned there, which I didn't put down, is that there are, that the event that we saw at the turn of the century, late 1800s, 1900s, was not the only arroyo cutting event that's affected Sienega Creek. Exactly. There have been multiple previous ones. Okay, so then we had archaic, archaic farmers established out there. That lesson is good agricultural dry land farming spanning hundreds of years. Hundreds of years that we had that practice. What year was that approximately? Well, archaeologists range. approximately 8,000 to 3,000. Sheila, we're not really capturing the uh, dinosaur stuff with the fossil beds. They were back here. Yeah. Okay. Do yeah. you want to add that? No. So this is me. <laughs> Are you sure, Dan? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want you to add. And another <laughs> lesson learned from all of this you just heard is that we have buried, very, very deep archaeological sites and paleontological sites are out there. So that's a lesson learned. Okay, by 1500 AD, we had the Sabiapri of settlers living out there which is a, a, sort of a cousin of Tohono O'odham, and the Apache Raiders, both those were out there. Um, 1540, we had Coronado Crossing, Father Kino, 1680, and then the livestock being introduced, 1700. So the less, what, another lesson learned for this is that it's a very multicultural setting, a very diverse history. Very, it did not begin with uh, Anglo settlement and ranching. It began a long time before. So, 1775, Tucson Presidio, and then somebody has to take over the 1800s. Who did? Who did? Our purple. purple. It's for 1821, and Mexican, Mexican independence. Here, have to okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh boy, there's so everyone rules. can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 1821 is Mexican independence. Now the land is under Mexican rule. Purple. Um, all right, so 1883 is the Baba Kamori land grant. They paid a whopping $390 for 120,000 acres. Um, and, and it's sort of a, a marker of that transition from being on, you know, from the European perspective, being on the frontier of New Spain to being a sort of fully part of Mexico for, and this area had that experience of being sort of fully part of the Mexican nation for, um, for only about 32 years. So a long um, time of being um, 
in, in the frontiers of New Spain, a relatively short time of being under the Mexican flag, exactly. Um, and then we have uh, 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, and uh, we had to look up some of the dates on this. <laughs> oh. um, but uh, so Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Mexican-American War, um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that actually set the, the U.S.-Mexico boundary up um, around the, uh, the Gila River. Um, but there was a, in the treaty itself, there was a discrepancy. It was the border was described um, in geographic terms in one location and in latitude-longitude terms. They, they, those conflicted. So part of the reason then for the Gadsden Purchase that was finalized in 1853 was to fix that discrepancy in the... Um, in the uh, original treaty, but the other reason for the purchase and why it brought, um, why the Gadsden Purchase brought the border, um, new border, southern border of the U.S. quite so far down, was to make sure that the U.S. Um, then had enough of the Sky Island topography to be able to run a railroad line between the mountains instead of having to go over any large mountains. So um, a great example of how geography dictates history and politics. Um, let's see, in, uh, uh, in surveying the new boundary, um, uh, uh, Emory's Boundary Survey had, um, there's a great book on it and, um, and lots of drawings from that uh, 18, uh, early 1850s. Um, and so Emory and his, and his crew were collecting um, well, species and, and documenting wildlife and all sorts of other things. And um, they actually got lost in the Sonoida Plains because they got confused between the Baba Camari, Sienega Creek, and Sonoida Creek. And they failed to meet up with their Mexican counterparts who were the only ones that actually knew the terrain. So they ended up camping on the banks of the Baba Camari and eating what um, is almost certainly to, uh, chub for about three weeks um, before they actually figured out where they were and, and managed to get across this swampy um, Cienega Valley to make their way on towards Tucson. 